Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant. There's Jerry Rowland. And this is Stuff You Should Know. Couldn't think of any um, non-problematic nicknames for us to use. (laughs) Well, you could probably just go, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Is that problematic? I figure that I'm sure, yes, we would probably hear about no, that. No, man, that's, uh, you watch any great kung fu movie, mm-hmm. and they all make that great, great sound after a good death punch. Uh, did you ever take kung fu when you were young or any kind of martial arts? No, I notoriously have zero interest in martial arts. And my biggest I, fear is that my daughter's going to want to do it. I, uh, oh, really? Well, I mean. Will you tell her to sweep the leg <laughs> at a tournament if she ever does? Yeah, sure. I mean, I want her, uh, like, to be <laughs> yeah, able sure. to protect herself. So that sounds like a very selfish thing. But as far as, like, going to martial arts tournaments, I uh, kind of, like, uh, just, you know, kill me now. <laughs> what You should get her interested in, like, um, wielding a knife or something. Oh, yeah. That'd be really cool. Or just being a good person so people don't pick fights with her. Yeah. Is that how things work? No, not at all. <laughs> so uh, I'll tell you somebody who liked to pick fights, not just would get into fights and, and accept the challenge, would actually pick fights. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that person also happens to be the person we're talking about today, one Mr. Bruce Lee. Yeah, Bruce Lee, uh, I mean, I'm sure like me, you spent the past couple of days watching a lot of Bruce Lee stuff. Mm-hmm. But my question is, were you into this? Did you watch Kung Fu movies and Bruce Lee movies? Only in so far as like the whole 90s like throwback thing. You know, I would have them on every once in a while and watch them, but I was never super into them. I had friends that were super into them. Okay. I, I, I remember, of course, I, I underwent extensive ninja training under mm-hmm. Sensei Tommy Roper mm-hmm. <laughs> as a much younger person. This is in the 80s. Yeah. Um, but I was never really into Kung Fu. Fu or, or uh, martial arts movies um, outside of that. Um, I will say, though, watching Fist of Fury last night, um, I, I, I was just absolutely blown away. Like, oh, did you that watch was, the whole thing? Yeah, the whole thing. So I think blackbeltkarate.com pirated the movie and put it on YouTube, the whole thing. And it is just really good. Like, the fighting in there is a Astounding, and it gives you like a really good like appreciation. It's hard not to appreciate what you're seeing with Bruce Lee when you when you watch it. Yeah, I have still not seen many of those movies, but for uh, a movie crush episode, one of my guests, um, uh, Stuart Wellington of the Flophouse Podcast, one of my favorite uh, other podcasts on movies, mm-hmm. he had me watch his favorite movie, which is Ricky O. Colon, the story of Ricky. And dude, you have to see this movie. Okay. It is the gory, over the top, crazy martial arts movie to beat all over the top, gory, crazy martial arts movies. It is when was, nuts. When was it made? It, well, 91, but it seems like 78. Um, it's, wonder, it's amazing. Is there a shot where some guy jams his fingers into his opponent's? testicles and then they cut to a view from inside <laughs> his scrotum and you see the fingers <laughs> wiggling did that happen because i saw a martial arts movie that had that and i was like well there it is no but that it's, is it's the glorious thing i've ever seen it's got a lot of stuff like that but i don't think it, that was from rickio but it's, a, it's okay you're on the right track there as far as okay you know it's not for everybody <laughs> i gotta check it out man it's pretty fun you had me at you're on the right track there yeah um, so Bruce Lee movies were not nearly as violent, but for the time they were they were exceedingly violent. It seems like, and it, it, Bruce Lee laid the foundation that people said, "Well, I want to top that. I want to top that." Um, and w- while maybe gore, there was plenty of like blood in in Fist of Fury, at least, and other movies that he made. But um, it wasn't anything like what we just no, talked no, no. about. But the I think the larger point for Bruce Lee is that he he laid this foundation. Like, he introduced the United States and the West to the idea of not just kung fu movies, but of, like, 
Asians being heroes, like uh, like protagonists, mm-hmm. like like tough, you know? Because up to that point, not necessarily exactly up to that point, but awfully close to it, um, especially in the West, uh, the people from China, uh, Japan, seemed very docile, cerebral, I saw, um, not at all like Bruce Lee. And right. Bruce Lee changed all of that. All, basically single-handedly, especially as far as America's concerned. Yeah, with a single one-inch punch. <clears throat> basically. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about his early life because he had a pretty interesting background, a uh, pretty interesting genetic family tree um, because, you know, we all think of him as uh, Chinese and he was certainly – he certainly was Chinese. But um, if you if you poke around his lineage and you, you will learn that his maternal great-grandfather – was Dutch Jewish, which is really interesting. He was a merchant. Mm -hmm. His name was Mm -hmm. Moses uh, with a Z, Hartog Boseman. Mm -hmm. And he went to Hong Kong in the 1850s as part of the Dutch uh, East India Company, became the Dutch ambassador to Hong Kong, had six kids with his concubine. And then one of those kids, one of his sons, uh, Ho Kam Tong, he became a very rich man. He had a wife, 13 concubines, and a British mistress, and mm-hmm. then he had a daughter with a British mistress, and that was uh, Bruce Lee's mom. Yeah, that's it sounds one more heck confusing of an than it is. Yeah, yeah. So Bruce Lee was part Jewish, part British, um, and lots of Chinese uh, mixed together. His father was one hundred percent Chinese, Han Chinese, mm-hmm. um, and his father was uh, born poor, but he actually worked his way up to. Uh, fairly sizable celebrity uh, in Hong Kong, um, I, or was it China? I don't remember if, if, Bruce, Lee, if Bruce, Lee, Bruce Lee's father lived in Hong Kong or China. Well, it was kind of both. He was a, a Cantonese opera star and an actor, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and then I think eventually they did settle in Hong Kong. Okay. All right. So, um, it, but he was, like, very well-known. Like, he was in movies. He was on TV. Like, he was a pretty famous guy. He was probably, I would liken him to, uh, Ooh. <laughs> Jerry Orbach. He was the Jerry Orbach <laughs> of his time and place. Was Jerry Orbach you know? a singer? No, but he was, like, everywhere. He oh, was in okay. everything from Dirty Dancing to Murder, <laughs> She Wrote, you know? Like, he was all over the place. And he was multi-talented, too. Okay. Don't try to tell me Jerry Orbach is not multi-talented, because he is. Sure, but he was no opera star. You don't know that. You're right. You're right. I could be I could be a martial arts expert. Jerry That's Orbach true. could be an opera star. <laughs> right. We can be whatever we want to be in our mind's eye. But so Bruce Lee's father was the Jerry Orbach of his time and place. That's right. So uh, he was touring the U.S. when Bruce was born. Uh, he was born in San Francisco in 1940, uh, mm-hmm. and his parents named him Lee Jun Fan. And apparently a nurse said, you should call him Bruce for his English name. <laughs> they said, what? What did you just <laughs> yeah, say? Exactly. Did you hear what we named him originally? Yeah. She's like, yeah, Bruce. Bruce. Right? <laughs> Lee Jun Fan, Bruce. Uh, <laughs> they moved back to Hong Kong when he was a baby. And he grew up there, but he grew up with um, going to English schools, English language private schools. Yeah. So um, he always kind of had this, this um, I don't want to say split identity, but his, his identity, his sense of self was definitely divided between America and um, I, I believe the UK to an extent, and also obviously Hong Kong. Um, and then, of course, his ancestry in China. Like he, he, he seemed to have... Um, not necessarily like felt spread all over the place, but in in a different sense, he was more open to influences wherever he found them. I saw somebody somebody say that Bruce Lee learned from everybody, everyone that he came in contact with, um, including people who he had to fight, who fought of different styles. He he was always open to learning something. He didn't. He was very cocky. He was very arrogant by a lot of people's um, estimations, but he also was. Uh, humble enough to want to learn wherever he he thought he could learn something new. Uh, and I think that that, according at least um, to a guy named Matthew Pauly, who's known as one of his um, better biographers, uh, that, that really kind of underscored that 
that um, that his personality just kind of being divided among different places around the world and, and having different influences. Yeah, so we'll, we'll take a little break here and we'll come back and talk about um, some of the early formative years of young Bruce Lee right after this. All right. So Little Bruce was born uh, not only in the Year of the Dragon, but the Day of the Dragon. And his nickname was Little Dragon when he became a child actor. Uh, if you mm-hmm. only know Bruce Lee from his martial arts work, his kind of short career in martial arts films, he he was actually uh, on screen as a baby. Um, but his real first kind of role was, I think, when he was like 10 years old. Uh, yeah, he was in a movie called The Kid. Yeah, which I watched some clips of this. I'm sure you did too. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, you know, it's cute little Bruce Lee. He does, he kind of throws A lot his... of child abuse in it. <laughs> was it really? Yeah, he's like, he offers, he has some money, so he offers to help his uncle out, and his uncle just psh, basically deafens him in one ear. Well, yeah, I didn't see that clip. <laughs> I would call that child abuse, Chuck. No, I would too. I didn't see that clip. <laughs> You're like, yeah, well, I guess if that's your definition of child abuse. No, no, not at all. I just didn't see that one. I just saw the one where he was kind of did that famous Bruce Lee sort of, uh, you know, thumb across the nose and throw his little shirt open. I know. That's crazy that, like, he was that young, 10 years old, and he's already, like, laying the groundwork for the things that were going to make him famous in the future. Yeah, and he was a little guy. He, um, I think he, you know, as a as a full-grown adult, he, he reached 5'7", about 130 pounds. He was not very big. When he was a kid, he was very small. He was fairly weak uh, because of food rations, because Hong Kong was occupied by Imperial Japan at the time, mm-hmm. uh, and they were rationing food out. There was a cholera epidemic. He had mm-hmm. one leg shorter than the other. He had an undescended testicle, uh, which actually ended up keeping him out of Vietnam. So, oh, I didn't know that. A little bit of a silver lining there. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had glasses. He had acne. Uh, I think his biographer said that he, and this is the only person I really saw say that, but he said he'd probably be diagnosed with ADHD today. Uh, I looked for other places to find that, and no one, I don't think, is on record as saying that, but it did seem like that could be possible because he was very active, uh, had trouble with focus, but could also hyper focus. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like you, you know, like you said, he would kind of pick fights with people because he was a little kid, and that's a lot of times little kids will do that if they want to, you know, they want to prove that they're strong and have value. They'll pick fights and try and beat people up. Not not the way to do it, though, kids. No, but I mean, like, like he was well known in Hong Kong as being like this kind of local tough who would start fights um, and frequently won them, but sometimes would lose them too. Um, but there was one fight in particular that he lost around the age of 15 or 16 um, to a kid who had been studying a Kung Fu style called Wing Chun. Yeah, Wing Chun. Um, and that is where his famous um, like one-inch punch comes from, that style of fighting. It's uh, really good for closed quarters type fighting where your opponent's right in front of you and coming at you. Wing Chun's very good for that. So that was the kind of dude that Bruce Lee was even back when he was a a little uh, hot shot 15-year-old. He lost a fight to somebody and he wanted to know how that person had beat him, so he went and learned it. And that um, actually formed the basis for his his formal education in martial arts was entering into the Wing Chun school um, at age 15. Yeah, and I looked a little more into Wing Chun to see what it was kind of all about. And apparently there's two sort of main tenets, which is the centerline theory and then stand and guard. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the centerline theory is basically you draw a line from the center of your body to your opponent's body, and that is the quickest route to strike. So if you've got someone coming at you like – you know, if you go throw a punch like American boxing style, like a haymaker, you're going mm-hmm. up and around toward the jaw to the side of the jaw. Mm-hmm. If you're practicing Wing Chun, you are standing right in front of that person. And as you're throwing your haymaker, you've gotten a, a very quick straight punch to your solar plexus. Right. And you're like, what just happened? 
that is basically the essence of Bruce Lee's style. Super lightning fast would take advantage of you while you thought you were about to strike him. He used that against you. Whatever flaw there was in what you were doing to to hit or kick him or come at him, he would he would take advantage of it and hit you within that time. And and like if you watch any of his movies, you can see it quite clearly. But he'd been working on that. I didn't realize that that was necessarily Wing Chun. I thought that was his own style. Um, but it would make sense because again, that was Wing Chun is the is the the foundation for his style of kung fu that he ended up coming up with. Right. So, um, like we said, his dad was fairly famous. Mm-hmm. Bruce is in this— Like Jerry Orbach level famous, <laughs> don't forget. Bruce is in this movie when he was 10 years old called The Kid. That was mm-hmm. a big success. And then they said, hey, let's sign this kid up to do some sequels. And his dad said, no, 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 no. My kid's <clears> not going to be an actor. He's going to be a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. Um, and he's always in trouble in school, so I'm not going to let him be in, uh, sign this contract. Uh, he ended up being in some movies kind of off and on. I think he ended up being in about 20 different movies that before his kung fu movie days. Right. But it was never like he never turned into the big kid star that they were trying to uh, get him to be with that first contract, I think. Yeah, apparently he would have been had his father not directly intervened to make sure that didn't happen. Which is pretty interesting, but... Um, oh, he was 10. He can't sign a contract without Daddy saying so and Mommy saying so. Well, yeah, you definitely need to have your parents' support like that for sure. Um, but the, so his father, like, stepped in and said, no, you're going you're gonna to do something else. And um, that was at age 10. I don't know. I think at least 18 at the latest. But at some point, he um, had kind of gotten... Like, like I said, he had a reputation as, like, a local tough street fighter in Hong Kong. Um, and I guess he fought another kid and, and beat him quite badly. And the kid turned out to be the son of a local mob boss. I don't know if he was a boss or a, like a, a connected mob guy. But one, some, a member of the triad. It does sound like a movie. And um, that between that and the Hong Kong police basically saying, like, look, your kid is totally on our radar and it's a real problem and he's going to end up in jail or dead if he keeps this stuff up. And by the way, the local the local mob now wants to kill him because he beat up one of the one of the the boss's sons. Um, his father was said, You're out of here. You're going to America. Um, which again, this wasn't like a complete out of the blue place to send Bruce Lee. This was the land that he was born. He was he had an American passport. He was an American by birth. And he also had family there too. But this is the first time that he was living on his own. From what I saw, his father gave him $800, which was pretty substantial back then. He said, here are the addresses of some family in uh, the Pacific Northwest. Head on out to San Francisco. And he started in San Francisco and ended up in Seattle pretty quickly, I believe. Yeah, Seattle in the... Um in, in college, he went to uh, UW, and he, you know, that money obviously would run out, so he had to get a job. He worked as a busboy in a Chinese restaurant, actually lived in the restaurant, kind of a closet mm-hmm. type of deal. Mm-hmm. And everyone started hearing about his uh, his martial arts skills and the fact that he was pretty good at this stuff. So he started teaching a little bit on the side in that Wing Chun style, and he met Linda there, who would uh, go on to be his wife. Uh, she was a fellow student of his. Um, Linda got pregnant, and they got married. They were very young. They were still in college, and they had little Brandon Lee. Uh, we'll we'll talk about him later on, and then uh, a daughter named Shannon. Yeah. Um, so all of a sudden, Bruce Lee, who is a um, a busboy at a Chinese restaurant, and also teaching um, kung fu on the side, has a family, a wife kid, then kids, and um, he's got, he needs money now more than he ever did before. And he has a pretty good idea. He's going to start opening a a franchise of martial arts studios because martial arts was already known in the United States, but typically it was kept within the whatever Asian community that practiced it, right? So like if it was Kung Fu, uh, you would find almost entirely Chinese uh, people learning it, Um, that, you know, immigrants to the country or they're the children of immigrants. Um, 
Taekwondo. It would be like Korean families. Um, and Bruce Lee said, you know what? I want to kind of e- explode that. There's a lot of talk about whether he was the first person in the United States to come along and open up martial arts to anybody who wanted to learn of any race, any ethnicity, women, men. From what I saw, that's not necessarily true. But they, that is um, often credited as uh, as evidence of just kind of how um, cocky and unconventional and, and um, disrespectful, I guess, of norms and traditions just for the fact that you know, or just for norms and traditions sake. Um, and, and I don't know if he was the first person to teach just anybody who wanted to learn, um, but it definitely fell within his uh, persona, his outlook of martial arts, which is, you know, I'll take what, I'll, I'll learn whatever I can and put it in to my fighting style so that I survive. And um, that would make sense to kind of flip it on the, op- on, on the other way and say, well, you know, I'm going to teach this fighting style to whoever wants to learn it. Yeah, and it turns out it was just as he ended up learning Wing Chun because of a fight he had early on, he also expanded his fighting style because of another fight, Mm -hmm. um, which this sounds like it – I mean, I think there are a lot of legends and tall tales around Bruce Lee as well. Mm -hmm. This story story sounds a little dubious, but maybe it's true. It's – it is – it's – not dubious. It definitely happened, but there it was closed to the public, and there were only three eyewitnesses there. And two, one gives a conflicting report from the other two, to a large degree. But it's been so thoroughly studied and researched by some people, like that Matthew Pauly guy spent a year just researching this fight alone. <laughs> there, there was another guy named um, Charles Russo who wrote a book called Striking Distance. He spent a decade on that book, and he interviewed a hundred people just for that to, to, for that fight alone, because it's the one of the most legendary fights that's ever happened in the history of the world, and only three people were there to see it besides the fighters. Yeah, they interviewed a hundred people <laughs> about what right. they heard, what happened. <laughs> Basically, yeah, I mean that's as close as they could get, um, aside from the people who were there, who were again saying, you know, this is kind of conflicting. But overall, what seems to be the the ultimate upshot of it is that it was at least a, a draw. It seems like it was a draw. Yeah. He fought a man named Wong Jack Man, and apparently it was a pretty brutal fight, like you were saying, very legendary. And uh, yeah, conflicting reports. Let's just call it a draw. Let's be magnanimous here. <laughs> uh, but at the end of this, you know, the sort of upshot is, it was that Bruce was like, I have limits now with Wing Chun. And I need to, uh, like, I need to be able to to best larger opponents because I'm a small guy. I need mm-hmm. to I need to really kind of ramp up my study, if I'm especially if I'm a teacher, and and kind of get better basically. So he came up with his own uh, jam, and that's called uh, Jeet Kune Do, uh, the way of the intercepting fist. And this was a little bit. He was a really really good boxer. I don't think we've mentioned that yet. Um, if he had only boxed and dedicated himself to being a boxer, he probably could have been like a, a belt holding boxer uh, mm-hmm. and like an Olympic champion. Mm-hmm. Um, so he incorporated elements of boxing. He incorporated all the Wing Chun that he had learned, uh, mm-hmm. and then fencing, which his older brother did, uh, which is you know when you're lunging at your opponent, but instead of a, a, a foil, he would use his fist. And if you um, you know I mentioned the the one inch punch earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was also the six-inch punch. There's tons and tons of videos and breakdowns of what that is, but that's what he was really famous for, which is basically, and then Tarantino kind of you know borrowed for the uh, Kill Bill movies. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you put your fingers on like the sternum of a of a human, and that's how far you punch from. Like you don't rear back and swing or anything. You just use your hips and your legs, and you focus your energy. And all your momentum to just very, very quickly punch and push somebody. And w- and even from one inch, you can knock somebody backwards like seven feet. So, and that's super helpful if you can do that. But what that one fight um, with um, uh, Wong Jack Man taught him, Wong Jack Man kept moving away from him. And if your fighting style is entirely about fighting in close quarters with your opponent coming at you, if your opponent is getting away from you, you're just kind of 
up up the creek. And that's what really kind of opened his eyes that he needed to expand it. And so, like you said, he incorporated boxing and he incorporated fencing. He also realized that he needed grappling, too. He didn't have any grappling moves. And apparently that came um, into focus when he was on set for a TV show that he would end up being on for a season called The Green Hornet, yeah. which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and apparently, on the set of the Green Hornet, he would he was he became quickly known for actually beating up the stunt doubles, rather than you know pulling his punch and just you know not making contact or just barely making contact. He was punching these guys and kicking these guys, and um, they apparently brought in a ringer named Judo Jean Labelle, who was a very tough stuntman, a two-time judoku uh, champion. Um, And brought him in as a stuntman. And the first day on the set, he picked up Bruce Lee uh, out of nowhere, put him in a fireman carry, like on his shoulder. And Bruce Lee had, he couldn't do anything. He was just so mad, but there was nothing he could do to get out of this. And he realized he needed to incorporate grappling. And he ended up training with Gene LaBelle for a year and expanded his fighting style even further. And that fireman carry... That meeting, that fight, basically, on the set of The Green Hornet is what Quentin Tarantino was recreating in that movie Once Upon a Time in Hollywood when Cliff Robertson, um, Brad Pitt, fights Bruce Lee on the soundstage in the the parking lot. Um, And a lot of people were very upset because he took tremendous liberties with that fight. But it was based on this kernel of history that had a much better outcome than than what, um, what Quentin Tarantino showed. Yeah, Cliff Booth, by the way. Cliff Robertson Cliff was, a, Booth. was a real actor. <laughs> oh, was he? Yeah. Wait, I thought he was the basis for Metallica. <laughs> no, that was Cliff somebody else, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, Tarantino, we, we should kind of talk about that for a sec because he was taken to task by a lot of people, um, certainly people from Bruce Lee's own family, for mm-hmm. that scene and – they were like, he, this is not what Bruce Lee was like, his daughter especially. It's like, this is not what my dad was like. He was not cocky. He was not arrogant. He was confident mm-hmm. and he was a good teacher. But, you know, Tarantino then fired back in some interviews like he was arrogant and cocky. He was known as this guy. And mm-hmm. apparently the people closest to him said he wasn't at all. This is a misconception by white people. And huh. uh, Tarantino took a lot of grief and sort of argued back, and then she finally, in uh, an interview in Variety magazine, was like, "He should just kind of shut up about this, yeah. and, and say I'm making fictionalized movies and not purport to know what my dad was like." Yeah, when it's coming from the daughter, it seems <laughs> like you should probably just shut up for sure. Probably so, and we'll probably get an email from her too because you said he was cocky and arrogant. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I was thinking back to that, flashing back. Um, and one, I guess, one thing I saw to to kind of that gives weight to the idea that he had a certain amount of arrogance or cockiness, or I can understand how some people would take him that way or portray him that way, um, is he was well known for going around publicly insulting established martial arts schools. Like one of the first things he did where he made a name for himself among the martial arts community, especially in the Bay Area, that some people say led to that fight between him and um, Wong Jack Man was to insult basically every established martial arts school in America and say that these were um, they were taught by old tigers with no teeth, basically that they were misguided um, and that they were, they were just wrong and that his way was the right way. Um, and it wasn't that he had it out for like the old establishment just because they were the old establishment. But what he had decided um, with Jeet Kune Do is that it was it didn't make any sense to train and train and train to know exactly where your feet are going to go and exactly where to put your fists or that kind of thing because all that stuff dissolves in a real fight. And so to Bruce Lee and his fighting style, the whole point is to survive the fight. And so you use whatever you can get your hands on, whatever technique, whatever style is going to work. And that that really doesn't jibe with the idea of a, an established rigid school. So he certainly ran afoul of um, of some of the established martial art groups. Um, and I, I think that that has kind of contributed to this idea that he was cocky in real life. I'm not his daughter, so I certainly can't say, but you know, 
Um, that's that's what I was basing my interpretation on. Yeah, my read is that he was a business person and mm. that he was trying to make some money because uh, his idea was that he wanted to open up a chain of kung fu schools. Mm-hmm. Um, he goes back to L.A. to give a demonstration at a karate tournament uh, to try and, you know, make a little uh, headway there with maybe getting investors or getting people interested. Mm-hmm. And it worked. He met a TV producer there. And that is how he got the role on The Green Hornet, uh, which, like you said, ran for a single season. And he stayed in Hollywood, though, and he really got the acting bug, I think. He was in a few um, kind of smaller parts over the next few years. He played Winslow Wong in uh, the movie Marlowe in 1969. And then he, like you mentioned kind of at the beginning, it, mm. it, it was he was trying to do something that didn't exist yet, which was become an Asian uh, and at least a, an Asian American hero because they just didn't right. do that. They were like, you can play this kind of role. Um, you, you're probably going to come in as the bad guy or something. You're going to show off some of your kung fu skills, but you're not going to be the star of the movie. And he said, all right, I'll hang around here. I'll start making a ton of money teaching the Hollywood elite uh, my fighting style and mm-hmm. ended up made, making some really, really close friends. Uh, notably, James Coburn and Steve McQueen ended up being two of his closest friends over the years until his death. They were uh, pallbearers, too. Yeah, along with um, uh, Chuck Norris, of course. Yeah. He was a pallbearer. I also saw Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate were two of his students, too. Yeah, Roman time. Polanski tried to... Uh, Sleep with him? No, he... I'm surprised. Bruce Lee lost his glasses... Roman Polanski found some glasses like his at the murder scene, and Roman Polanski was very suspicious of that and apparently what? went so far as to um, take Bruce Lee to get a prescription made uh, to replace the glasses that were broken and then uh, wanted to get his hands on that prescription and compare them, and apparently they didn't match, so he, you know, he backed off. He suspected Bruce Lee and the Manson family murders? He or the Tate uh, LaBianca murder. I don't want to. I don't want to put any words in Roman Polanski's mouth, but I'm telling you what happened, which is that he found these glasses and had them checked out. Wow, that's a Hollywood nugget, Chuck. That <laughs> you you just put that jewel in your crown right there. Well, that I didn't amazing. discover it. I mean, I just read it. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, it's well known. Oh, okay. Well, whatever. I didn't. <laughs> you can wear the crown around me, and I'll just be like okay. totally earned. Uh, he got really into health and fitness. Um, this was a time in the 1960s, kind of before the big exercise and weightlifting boom and stuff that happened. He was he was eating protein shakes and lifting weights kind of before a lot of people were. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he wanted to get his body in the best shape possible. And if you've ever seen Bruce Lee's body, then he, you know, he did exactly that. Yeah, mission accomplished for sure. And, I mean, again, he was a little guy. Like, he weighed 130 pounds, but he was just— as lean as they come and totally chiseled. Like, he he was very, very strong for his, his size and stature um, and just lightning fast, too. But none of this was amounting to anything as far as his film career was concerned. He was going quite far as a martial artist, uh, martial arts instructor, for sure. But clearly, he... Um, I don't know if his he felt like his calling was always, you know, the movies... Or TV. I think so. Or or something like that. Okay. Well, then that would explain it. I had the impression that, you know, he just knew that that was something he could do, um, which he he apparently was starting to accumulate some debt. And at one point to keep his uh, to keep his his chain of um, uh, of martial arts studios open, he decided to go to Hong Kong and do some acting rather quickly and pick up some some fast money. So. I I didn't know if he considered that like a step toward stardom or if that was just he knew he could go make some money acting and come back and pour it back into the studios to keep them open. Do you know? I mean, I think the studios were making his living, but I think since he was 10 years old, he was bitten by the acting bug, Mm -hmm. which is why he went on to be in 20 more movies over the next eight years. Yeah, true. And I think that was his true, like— I think the Kung Fu Studios, in my reading, was the means to get to where he wanted to be, which was a big Hollywood superstar. Well, it actually it worked. That trip, um, like I was saying, he he was just going for some money to keep the studios or his his studios afloat. 
um, or open. Um, but it turned out to be the greatest move that any actor has ever undertaken, just going to Hong Kong and trying to pick up some parts in, in uh, martial arts films. And that's exactly what he did, and he blew up as a result. That's right. So let's take our final break here, and then we'll come back and wrap it up and spank it on the bottom right after this. <laughs> All right, so Bruce Lee goes to Hong Kong to make some movies, make a little dough, mm -hmm. and he goes to Hong Kong and signs a two-picture movie deal with Golden Harvest Studios and signs on for his first movie, a little movie called The Big Boss, which uh, originally in the United States was called Fist of Fury. A little confusing because yeah. then there was a movie called Fist of Fury that also yeah. had an alternate title, uh, what's the that? Chinese the, yeah, connection. the Chinese connection. But the big boss, aka in America at first, the Fist of Fury or Fist of Fury, was his first sort of foray into those movies, and it was a big, big hit. It was. It's it's hard to uh, explain what happened. That that first movie, the Big Boss, came out and basically made Bruce Lee an overnight sensation in Asia, as far as martial arts is concerned. Not just Hong Kong, Asia. He just became an absolute superstar. Uh, the Big Boss shattered the box office record. The previous Hong Kong box office record was held by The Sound of Music, and it had made mm, something like eight hundred thousand Hong Kong dollars. Um, the uh, Big Boss made something like four times that in its box office run. Um, and then as more Bruce Lee movies came out over the next couple of years, each one shattered the record of the previous Bruce Lee movie. So when something like that happens, you know you have something once in a, a lifetime basically on your hands. And he was right smack dab in the, in the middle of that once in a lifetime thing. Yeah, and not only were these movies making a lot of money, they were really cheap to make, which was... Like, he was like the golden boy because uh, I think F Fist of Fury, the the second movie, cost mm -hmm. about $100,000 to make and made $100 million. Uh, I think the, um, the Way of the Dragon made $130 million and cost about 130000 So he was making, like, huge, huge money. I mean, not personally, but the studios were making huge, huge money on mm -hmm. very little investment. And... Um, the thing with Bruce Lee was he was, like you said, he was selling these fights better than anyone ever had, and his speed was really the key to it. Um, and a lot of, if if you watch a lot of older kung fu movies, and it looks like the action is sped up, it's because it is. They right. would speed up the camera, or actually slow down the camera to make the action appear faster, uh, to make it more exciting. But Bruce Lee was so naturally fast, they had to tell him to slow down just so the camera could, like, record stuff accurately. So they, <laughs> there were awesome. a few legends that grew up around his speed. Uh, one, uh, speed and strength, one that he could steal a dime off of your hand, like if you're holding it in the palm of your hand, before mm -hmm. you could just close your hand. Mm -hmm. uh, he could catch a rice grain that, that he, you would throw at him with chopsticks. And these are all, you know, maybe true or not, but I just love these legends. Wait, you would use chopsticks to throw a rice grain at him? No, no, no. You would throw a rice grain at him, and he would catch it with chopsticks. Oh, that's way more impressive. So, uh, and then the last one was that he could he could punch a hole through a can of Coke with his finger. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I hope these are true, because they're so great. Well, if they're not true, that's okay. Like, you're not the first person to fall for some of the exaggerations. Like, I saw Matthew Pauly was kind of not called out, but somebody made mention of the fact that this is one of his top biographers, like one of the best biographers of Bruce Lee, still said, you know, somebody got punched and they flew back six feet into the air. And it's almost certainly not correct. Uh. Like, six feet is probably an exaggeration. But the the fact that things like that get repeated and, like, like smart people like say like this like this is what he was capable of like it, it it at the very least goes to underscore his abilities that they were so 
mind-boggling that this is it's possible that that's true you know what i mean yeah it's not like oh that's ridiculous (laughs) it's like no this is bruce lee we're talking about i think i can explain the six feet thing okay if he's it might be an exaggeration that someone literally didn't touch the ground for six feet Uh but if you look at demonstrations of his of the one finger punch he can knock someone back six to eight feet very easily until they can, like, regain their composure. Like, I, people yeah, are flying you. back six feet, uh, but not necessarily not touching the ground in between. You I, know what I mean? I think this was, f- quote, flying through the air. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like the air, a little writer's flourish. Like yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but, I mean, again, it comes, like, people are like, oh, that's cool, that's crazy, because we're talking about Bruce Lee. If, if like, my biographer said that, right. everyone would be like, stop <laughs> the presses. Whoa, whoa, you got a <laughs> biographer? I question every. I will eventually. <laughs> I, I assume, but if people will be like, I question everything that's in this book now. With yeah. Bruce Lee, it's like, yeah, I totally buy that. You know. So Bruce Lee is uh, made a name for himself now. He is driving around in sports cars. He's wearing fur coats. He is a big, big pothead, which is something that. Oh yeah, I forgot about y- that. You don't hear about a lot, but apparently Even after Carl Sagan, right? Uh, yeah, but after Bruce Lee's training sessions, he would. Uh, he apparently had this wooden box just full of joints, also smoked uh, hash, and got really into the sort of hippie lifestyle. Kind of grew his hair long for a little while. <laughs> and I think it was wrapped up in this Hollywood hippie thing of the time. Understandable. Yeah. Uh, and his career's going along great, and it all culminates with a movie uh, called Enter the Dragon in 1973. Big movie. Yeah, it was a huge movie. I think he wrote and directed that one, and I I think the first one he wrote and directed was Way of the Dragon, but like by this time, uh, on his third movie, he was now writing and directing it, and certainly by his fourth one, he wrote and directed it. I saw that the Way of the Dragon, a quarter of the script, was just a couple of, like just a couple of fight scenes choreography, took up like a quarter of the script, um, and it was this was the one that put him on the map as an overnight sensation in the United States and the West. Like, the other two, the first two or three, um, yeah, his first three had made him an overnight sensation in Asia. This was the one that taught America what a kung fu movie was because we hadn't heard of it before, and now all of a sudden we couldn't get enough of Bruce Lee. Unfortunately, Bruce Lee had died a month before in one of the great ironic tragedies as far as, like, Hollywood stardom goes. Yeah, only 32 years old. Um, If you look up Bruce Lee death, there's a lot of different stories and theories out there. Um, He was, he had a mistress at the time named uh, Betty Ting Pai. And apparently he had been on, and this is the way Chuck Norris told it too. uh, Mm -hmm. Apparently he had been on back medication for a while because of a back injury. So pain meds for his back. Uh, Came home uh, to uh, his apartment in Hong Kong. Uh, with his mistress, uh, mistress complained of a headache. She gave him, a, I think, a different kind of pain reliever. Although Chuck Norris said it was a, uh, uh, what's I'm blanking now. What's the thing you take to fight an infection? And uh, antibiotic. Antibiotic, which I think he just misspoke because mm-hmm. that wouldn't mm-hmm. make any sense. But mm-hmm. um, that's what Chuck Norris said. Uh, so took another pain reliever, went down for a nap, and died. Never woke up. Uh, he. Um, you know, there are all kinds of speculation about what happened. It seems like it was just a reaction of these medications. Yeah. Uh, some people say, including the biographer, it was also had to do with uh, heat stroke. Because, yeah, because he'd had one 10 weeks before, right? Yeah, and he also, um, a few months before he died, had he used to be very embarrassed about his underarm sweat. So oh, he yeah. had the sweat glands removed from his underarms. What? And so apparently they said that could have contributed to the, you know, his body wasn't shedding sweat like it should, and that could have led to a heat stroke. I had not heard that before. That that definitely crosses a couple of the T's that I hadn't otherwise seen. Maybe, but I think it was like 10 weeks before he died, he collapsed when he was dubbing a movie in an un- uh, a room without air conditioning. It was really <laughs> hot, got that heat stroke. Uh, yeah. And some people are saying this all contributed with these medications to... Uh, a brain edema. 
Yeah, but again, I mean, the fact that he died mysteriously, this guy who's like one of the fittest people on the planet so just dies after saying he has a headache and lies down yeah. and never wakes up, that's just conspiracy theory fodder for Eon. Sure. And it's still going on today. Like, apparently, the he had a break with the director, Lo Wei, who directed the first two Bruce Lee films, um, the f- first two kung fu films he was in. He pulled a knife on him because the guy, the director had been taunting him and Bruce Lee was... Uh, there was a legend that, like, Lo Wei had had him assassinated by ninja or something like that. But the the upshot of it is, is however he died, um, he died, like, a month before he became, ext- like, world famous. And he's still world famous today. Like, everyone knows Bruce Lee. He's one of the most famous people to ever live. And he died a month before that happened, which is... You know, you say that and you read it and you think it, it it just doesn't quite sink in. And when it does, you're like, that is astounding that that happened, just the timing of all that. Yeah, and then, you know, many years later, his son Brandon Lee would die very tragically on the set of a film because of an accident with a um, a blank bullet um, actually shooting a, a slug out of a gun on set mm-hmm. of, uh, of The Crow, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, he, I think he was 28, and his father had died when he was 32. So a lot of people are like, well, that's, clearly the Lee family is cursed. Right, which is nonsense. It's just yeah, I think an Shannon's accident and a tragedy. Is, you should probably just shut up about that. Probably so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, one of the things that it's hard to overstate, like the cultural legacy that he left. Yeah. Like he introduced the West to a completely different concept of Asian people. Like, like oh, they can actually like star as action heroes like they're they're not like you know valets or servants or whatever like it just completely altered americans understanding of asian people and the, like it's really hard to understate that and then the other thing too is you know we were kind of talking about whether he was um you know whether he was an actor or a martial artist and a lot of people are like would is bruce lee would he actually was he a really a good fighter or was he like a movie fighter like jean claude van damme or steven seagal who like in a real life fight that would just be whoa, hopelessly whoa, whoa. lost <laughs> <laughs> you know and um because bruce lee died at such a young age like there's there's not this we don't know, or a lot of people don't know, but if you talk to the people who trained with him, who worked with him, who were there, who actually physically interacted with him, like, it seems, like, completely understandable that he was, as everything you saw on film, he could do for real in real life. And you would never have wanted to fight Bruce Lee. So he wasn't just a fake movie martial artist. He was the real deal. And in a lot of ways, largely self-taught, which makes him all the more impressive. That's right. You got anything else about Mr. Bruce Lee, Chuck? I got nothing else. Maybe watch uh, the classic 1982 uh, farcical comedy, They Call Me Bruce. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I will check that out. That th- One more thing. That, that his death, his untimely death, led to a whole uh, genre of movies called Bruce Bruceploitation, which was basically fake Bruce Lee movies that trying to cash in on his fame. Yeah, I think he had a movie, another movie released after his death too, didn't he? That they compiled, yeah. like, footage and stuff for? I believe they were filming it when he died, and they didn't release it for another five years. Game of Death. That's yeah, the Game one where Death. he fights Kareem That's Abdul That's Jabbar. fun to watch, actually. And Chuck Norris is in it, too, Game of Death. Yeah, that, that fight with Kareem was pretty awesome because <laughs> to see a man that tall be that lithe and that quick was is pretty <laughs> yeah. impressive. And he was one of Bruce Lee's, like, genuine students, oh, yeah. one of his longtime students, and he credits Bruce Lee with his, his longevity in the NBA. Totes. Um, yeah. So if you want to know more about Bruce Lee, just go out and start watching movies and videos and demonstrations of Bruce Lee. There's a lot worse things you can do with your time. And thank us later. And since I said thank us later, it's time for listener mail. Yeah, I'm going to call this uh, Return of Noah from Scotland. I'm pretty sure I read this on the air, but I told Noah to write in once a year. Mm -hmm. Um, And here's the follow-up, because, you know, Sarah, the amazing 11-year-old fan, is now probably in college and has long since forgotten about us. So we miss Sarah. We've been ghosted. We have been ghosted years ago. Uh, But this is our new friend, Noah. Uh, Hey, it's me, Noah, from Scotland. Uh, You told me to write in once a year, so this is my annual letter. In case you don't remember me, I've been listening since I was four and writing you a letter every year since I was five. Uh, I still live in Scotland, and for most of the last year, my mom's been homeschooling me because of the coronavirus. It's not always great, 
But when I'm uh, doing my own topics, I can choose them based on your episodes. Nice. Uh, my favorite was space weather because I didn't know there was weather in space. Uh, my favorite fact that I found out was the most powerful northern lights can generate over one tr- trillion watts of power, which is, I think, about 300 million solar panels. Uh, it was a hard sum, but I think it's right. Uh, I don't, you're, if you're asking us about math, then no, we're just going to say yes, you got it right. <laughs> you just ran a circle around us. Uh, I don't want to be an engineer anymore, by the way. I really like chemistry now. I think oh, cool. uh, the periodic table is interesting, and I want to find a way to stop global warming using science. Man, this kid. I love it. Uh, I've asked for your book for my ninth birthday in May, and I hope to get it because I think it'll be interesting. I'm glad you're still podcasting. Love from Noah. And uh, this was sent through his mom's. Uh, Rachel's email, of course, as always, and she added a very sweet note as well. So much love to the to Noah's family there. Yeah, thank you very much, Rachel and Noah and the whole fam for writing to us from beloved Scotland. Keep us uh, updated, Noah. We're pretty, your progress is just fascinating. Yes, I we love, love it. it. Um, and uh, happy early birthday, too, from Josh and Chuck. If you want to get in touch with us like Noah did, you can give it your best shot. You can send us an email. Send it to stuffpodcast at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.